if the world is on all four wheels and nothing is burning, you'll never hear from guys like me. But let's face it, when's the last time that was true? Chapter 2 Al Manzel Cafe, Zohar Ibn Abi Solma Street, Aleppo, Syria. So, they dragged me out of the back of an Iveco LMV that smelled of dog piss and human blood. Even with a black bag over my head, my eyes were watering. Can't begin to imagine how the four soldiers who nabbed me dealt with it. Many psychopaths don't care about smelly cars. Then again, maybe they do. Psychologically speaking, I'm a bit of a freak show myself, and it bothered me. Be kind of funny if I was crazier than a bunch of henchmen working for President Assad. Musings of a guy about to be tortured and killed. My hands were zip-cuffed behind my back. The beating they gave me was, I can assume, just a sort of greeting. Welcome to Syria, that kind of thing. I heard them open a heavy door and then heard it slam shut behind. Heavy locks and the dull thud of a crossbar being dropped into place. I stumbled along with two of them holding me under the armpits, counting my steps, numbering the hallways and turns. Down one flight, two, three, deep under somewhere. The place smelled a lot better than the vehicle except for one place where there was a heavy, rancid stink. It wasn't a dead smell, not exactly, not like a corpse. It was more of a gangrene stench, and I wondered if maybe some injured prisoner was locked up, rotting in the fetid darkness. But we moved on, and soon I could smell more wholesome things. Wheat, flour, lentils, figs, and coffee. A lot of coffee. Smelled good. And I could use a cup and a nice pastry. Maybe a Namura with some nuts on top? Yum. Another door opened. Creaky hinges. Dachunak, said a voice, male, middle-aged and authoritative, speaking Syrian Arabic. Defi akrusi. They did as they were told and put me in a chair. There was a whisk of a knife to remove the plastic cuffs and then a metallic clink as steel cuffs were snapped too tightly around my wrists threaded through the back slats of the chair. They were being very careful. Then the same voice said, Khalil Gata, take off the hood, which they did. In any hostage situation, it is generally not a good sign when they let you see their faces. It does not, as the saying goes, bode well. One is expected to be filled with a reasonable amount of dread. No problem, then. I was sweating heavy-caliber bullets, and I'm pretty sure my sphincter was never going to unclench. Ever. Even if I lived through this. I blinked my eyes clear. They had me in a small storeroom that was stripped of everything except shelves, the chair on which I sat, and a wooden table on which were the kind of items you never want to see outside of a horror movie. They were laid out to impress me, from the scalpels all the way to the bone saw. Eloquent. And, weirdly, a bottle of Diet Coke. The middle-aged man stood with his back to me. He was average height, slim, wore khakis and a white shirt. I watched him remove a blue sports coat, shake some cellar dust from it, and hand it to a guard. His shoes were highly polished, and his wristwatch was expensive. A Tog Heuer Monaco that had to run 40 grand. A lot of watch for a guy who was supposed to be a civil servant, but... Let's face it, corruption came with perks. Kind of the point. The four men who brought me here were dressed in clothes so obviously nondescript they might as well have worn uniforms. Jeans, dress shirts, sneakers. They moved like military, so they weren't fooling anyone. The middle-aged guy spent a few moments arranging the instruments on the table, straightening them, picking one or another up to examine as if they were Items at a juried craft fair, and he was a discerning buyer. It was all a bit of theater, psychodrama to unnerve whoever might be cuffed to that chair. I doubted I was the first person to attend this show. Turn around. I willed him to get on with it. Turn around and let me see those baby blues. Hoping they would be blue eyes. 
just like I was hoping there would be a white streak in his mustache if, in fact, he had a mustache. Turn around, bright eyes. And now I had the damn Bonnie Tyler song playing in my head. He turned. I almost smiled. He had the biggest, brightest, sunniest blue eyes you'd ever want to see in the face of a practiced torturer and state-sponsored terrorist. And the white streak? Yep. Just under his left nostril. Kasim Almasi. And he held a slender boning knife the way a conductor holds a baton, ready to make music. We were very clear, he said, still speaking in Arabic. They were to send no one, no police, no military. That's not what I am, I said in the same language. I tweaked it with a vaguely Eastern European accent. My men said you moved like a soldier. You spotted them following you, tried several very professional methods to evade pursuit, and had an unregistered disposable phone. Not a soldier, I repeated. I'm private security. Security for whom? asked al Masi. We were very specific when we spoke to her father. I know, but I'm not working for Mr. Jacobson. He touched the point of the boning knife low so that it rested very lightly on my crotch. Then who are you working for? I smiled. I work for Overligen Kiemi. That hung in the air for a moment. Overligen Kiemi was the Norwegian company that made industrial pesticides and agricultural antifungals. Oliver Jacobson was a journalist who'd infiltrated the company to gather irrefutable proof that a new generation of weaponized mycotoxins were being developed for sale to the Syrian government. These bioweapons caused immediate anaphylaxis. Unlike sarin gas, which was President Assad's favorite toy for urban pacification, these fungi were specifically designed to look like a natural mutation. Better murder through chemistry. Jacobson got out with a lot of information enough to put the entire company out of business and its executives in jail. It would also get the United Nations to stop fucking around and step in to take Assad down. Assad's spies got wind of it almost too late. They tried to pick up Jacobson, missed him by three minutes, and kidnapped his only daughter, Astrid, instead. The deal was simple. Jacobson had to turn himself and all of his research in to Assad's goons. That included email passwords and all other access that would prove that he had no copies and had sent no story to his news service. Fail to do so, and Astrid would be gang-raped, tortured, and dismembered, all of which would be recorded on high-def video for her father to watch. The boning knife pressed down. Why would Overligen Kemi send a field agent? asked Almasi. We are handling it. Don't they trust us? He contrived to look shocked and hurt. I shrugged. Because they don't trust anyone, would you? Almasi smiled. And what is your brief? To find where the girl's being held to make sure she's alive. And what does her being alive matter to you? Because her father hasn't turned himself in yet, I said. And there's no chance at all he'd do so without proof of life. He's going to need that. I mean, come on, we all know he's a dead man as soon as this deal closes. There's no reason to keep him alive and a lot of good reasons to cut his throat as soon as you have his files. Knowing he's walking into a death trap, he's got to believe his sacrifice will be worth it. So, yeah, he's going to want to see her alive. He's probably going to push to see her in person before he gives you the last passwords. My boss has sent me to make sure your team wasn't going to screw the pooch. He considered that for a moment, then stepped back. He didn't put the knife down. Bottom line here, I said, is that if this hits a speed bump, the guy who signs my paycheck goes away for life. Our whole company goes belly up, and you boys will need another group of mad scientists to cook up your next batch of party favors. Almasi turned and spoke to one of his men in rapid-fire Circassian, which is a language used in some villages in the Aleppo suburbs. I didn't understand a word of it. Not one of my languages. Then Almasi held a cell phone out to me. A man was yelling something harsh, but clearly not into the phone. Then a woman's voice, young and frightened, pleaded for help in Norwegian. 
I'd heard tapes of Astrid Jacobson. This was her. There was some yelling, and then Astrid screamed in serious pain. Almasi ended the call. The sound of the scream seemed to hang in the air for a moment, faint, but definitely not an echo from the call. I heard the scream wind down and disintegrate into weeping. Astrid was here. I smiled. Thanks, I said. Almasi raised the boning knife. Whoa, I yelped. What gives? He approached slowly. I want you to give a message to your employers, he said, still smiling. I want you to explain that sending you was clumsy and stupid, and that we will not tolerate any further. There was a click and a rattle, and then a metallic click-clack. It stopped him, and his eyes flicked down to the floor. The guards looked down, too. My handcuffs lay there. Fuck it, I was a cop and then a spec ops shooter for a bunch of years. If I couldn't get out of a pair of handcuffs, then I wasn't even trying. I smiled and said, Oops. Thank you for listening to this clip provided to you by Macmillan Audio. To hear more, look for this title wherever audiobooks are sold.